Hey, hey, peacemakers, it's the Soul Coach coming at you with another episode. So sit back and let's find your peace of mind. Self love with Karima Knows is about Karima Knows explaining her journey of celibacy. Um, Karima's life prior to celibacy was not perfect and she explains the trials and tribulations that she overcame to get to the point where she has turned her journey into a platform on her social media um, and she uses this to relate to others um, in regards to letting people know what the journey of celibacy entails and how you can pursue your own walk so listen up who is karima and who is karima knows so karima is um a college grad i graduated from indiana university of pennsylvania with my bachelor's and my master's degree i'm now employed um, at an agency that um, deals with labor relations so by day i investigate unfair labor practices and by night, I blog. Um, that's where Karima News comes in. I also mentor. I um, do just, you know, things that are more purposeful and kingdom outside of the, the norm of nine to five in everyday life. And so um, that's pretty much Karima and who she is right now and what I'm involved in. And the blog is Karima News, and you've seen the platform, I hope, and that is, uh, well, we'll get more into it later. How was the life growing up? Life growing up was, um, I had a good childhood. I mean, I had a single mother. Uh, She had three kids, uh, myself, and I had two brothers. I'm the youngest, and I'm the only girl. And so I was kind of, you know, more on the spoiled side. But I was a tomboy for uh, quite a bit because, you know, I only had brothers. So I didn't have any sisters outside of, like, my best friend was, like, my sister. But um, it was great. I did a lot. I mean, I did choir. I did basketball. I did drill teams for, like, a few years. So I just did a lot. And my mom was just very, you know, she was always working and, um, you know, just providing. But... Overall, she did great with me. Like, in school, my grades was always good. Went off and went to college. Did well for myself. So, um, growing up was good. Growing up was a good life. I can't really say I had it bad or anything like that, even though I only had one parent. Opposite of me. I am one of three girls on my mom's side. And on my dad's side, I have... Um, three sisters, so it's four of us. So in total, I have five sisters and no brothers. I have a stepbrother, but like that lives with me and that has been like with me all the time is nothing but girls. So oh, yeah, I wish I had awesome. brothers. <laughs> so they at could what? be they could be like fathers though. So I don't know. <laughs> But see, sometimes, see, my parents, they weren't married either, so they, I would spend time like half and half between each one of the parents' house, and my dad's married, so it was like, okay, I, I had my dad, like, when I was there, and then when I was with my mom, I didn't, so I, if I had a brother, I would, I would think as, of my uncle as my brother, my mom's younger brother, so... Mm-hmm. And that's who I think of as a, a father figure for me. So, Aww. what event was the turning point that made you choose celibacy? Um, June 2016, I'll never forget. Uh, I went to this happy hour. I went with my homeboy, who was strictly my homeboy, because I know nowadays when you say your homeboy, it'd be like, some of the other type stuff, but this is really my homie. We went out to this um, happy hour, but this happy hour in New York is kind of like a lit happy hour. It's kind of like a club just during happy hour hours, but you go to it after work. So uh, long story short, um, this night in particular, um, let me back up a little bit. 
before this night even came about, like I knew that I wanted to be celibate, but I wouldn't make the commitment. I knew it was something that God was calling me to do, but I just wouldn't do it. I just wouldn't commit. And it was kind of just like, you know, just a fear of failing pretty much. Like, I didn't want to mess it up. Like, say I'm going to do something and not do it. So fast forward to this night, this happy hour, um, I ran into this guy that um, I had met a couple years prior, maybe, give or take. And um, we had kept in touch on, like, social media, but it was, like, really nothing. And so that night, we seen each other and was like, hey, how you been? And all that other good stuff. And to make a long story short, um, I got really, really drunk because um, he was buying drinks. And my homeboy got really, really drunk. So uh, me and my homeboy got separated. And my homeboy was doing his thing. And I was like, listen, I'm about to go home um, because the party, the happy hour was like um, maybe on the train in New York. It would take me about an hour plus to get home. And by this point, I'm already drunk. So I'm like, I need to start heading home. And um, so the guy that I was getting reacquainted with, he was like, oh, well, you know, I'm about to leave too. Like, I can get you a taxi back to, like, your place. So I was like, cool. And so me, him, and his friend shared a taxi. Um, literally, we went around the block, and his friend got out, like, all right, see y'all, da 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 So then it was just me and him. And then he was like, um, oh, well, I work around here. Do you want to see my job? So the guy worked at Google. So, of course, who doesn't want to see Google, right? So I was like, okay. He's like, yeah, let's go. And this and the third. And next thing you know, I had another drink there. And so from there, it was just like dark. It was really, really dark. And um, next thing you know, um, it's really late now. Me going home was not really an option. And um, he asked me, like, oh, you know, he can get, like, Google employees can stay at this hotel, you know, he can get a room, get me a shirt to sleep in, et cetera. And I was like, okay, like, cool, whatever. And so long story short, I said long story short a couple of times, but I'm, I'm about to wrap it up right now. <laughs> so um, that night uh, is, is pretty much a blur. I don't know how much happened or didn't happen, but I remember – you know, how I looked at next morning, it was a, a, a wall right next to me. Um, like it was a, the wall was like, it had all mirrors on it. And so when I woke up, I woke up and I looked at myself, I had the t-shirt on and stuff. Um, but I looked at myself in the mirror and I just seen someone and I kind of just was like, who are you? Like, this is not who you are. Like, what are you doing here? Like all those questions just came into my mind. Like, you know, earlier that night, I told him I wanted to, I, I was trying to be celibate. Like, that's what I wanted to do. And then the next morning, I'm looking at myself in this mirror, like, how did you get here? And um, it just felt like this whole sex in the city night. Like, I just had this night that would happen on TV. And for me, it just wasn't me. It wasn't me. It wasn't what I was about. It it, it was just, you know, crazy. So um, after that, you know, uh, we got up, we had breakfast, and we sat by the pool, we talked, and he was like, hey, yeah, so um, how about next time we see each other, we go to church? And I'm like, what? Like, it ain't going to be no next time. <laughs> like, this is it. Like, in my mind, I'm thinking that. And so um, after that, I really just came home and um, talked to God, and that was really my turning point because um, I allowed myself to get drunk. I allow myself, I, I went into that night saying, you know, I want to be celibate, and that all went out the window. And so I just decided to stop playing. It was like, this is it, this is the time. So I fasted for two weeks, and I read the weight while I fasted, and I told myself before I read the book that at the end of it, I was going to make a decision. No more shell on the fence. I was going to commit. And at the end of my fast, and at the end of reading the book, I declared my vow to celibacy on June 26, 2016. And I never looked back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It does sound like something you would see in a movie or something. Because nowadays, all of the kids just want to experience things and think that, oh, it's lit and it's fun and it's a lituation. Like, oh, I was lit. Oh, I'm going to do that right. again. It was fun and it got turned up and, and everything. And they, like, we 
be, we look at it as a thing of it being like, oh, having the absolute most fun of your life. Right. You don't even right. remember who you talk to, where you go, and half of the things that happen that night. And I feel like that is one of the the sad things about it, that we think that when we when what is the word? When we use alcohol or drugs or anything to have fun, it's really we we just think it's it's a way to have fun and it's not even a way to have fun. You're really masking things that you're you're unhappy with and you really aren't really your true self. And yeah, so you're off I'm, track. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you really are. Like, it was a scary night for me. Not that I felt scared by him. I felt like mm-hmm. um, I was, you know, I just felt like after the fact, I just saw a guy hand in it because anything, I could have, like, gang raped. I could have got drugged that night. I could have, like, I wouldn't be able to tell you. But it's like, you know, I see how God's hand was on me and how he mm-hmm. protected me and how nothing happened to me and that, that I'm aware of anyway. But it's like um, I came out of that much, much, much better. And so I I kind of like, it's like, thank you, God. Like, you know, maybe I was just being hardhead. That's why I always say to people, um, you know, if God is telling you to do something, just do it. Because mm-hmm. I felt like I was, I knew God was telling me to do that, but I didn't want to commit. And I got to a place where it was like, I ain't have a choice. Like, <laughs> it was like, oh, you don't want to do it? All right, ha- go have fun. And I, I thought I was having fun. And um, when I was, when the night was over, I was like, you know what, God? All right, all yours. Like, I surrender it all to you. And, and I did. So, and all in all, it, it got me to where I am today. Okay, and for those who don't know the difference between celibacy and abstinence, um, can you define both of those and let people know? Yeah, so this is like, I didn't even know this was a thing until, like, I started blogging or whatever. But celibacy, if you look it up on Google, the word celibate comes from the Catholic Church. And it was used, um, the meaning of it is someone who's abstaining from sex and marriage for their entire lives. So usually this is like a priest or a nun or someone who has taken this vow to not have sex or be married for the rest of their lives. However, in the Christian community, we use the word celibate to describe a period of time where we're abstaining from sex until marriage. So I prefer to use the word celibate over abstinent because I feel as though well, I prefer to use the word celibate over abstinent because of the connotation that's tied to the word celibate as opposed to abstinent. You can be abstaining from, or you can be abstaining from sex, but you can be atheist. You know, so there's all these different possibilities. But if somebody asks me, um, you know, are you celibate? And I say, I'm, or if I tell them I'm celibate, they know exactly what I'm talking about and it ties to my faith. And they know that I'm waiting until marriage and I don't have to answer follow-up questions or, you know, um, get into all that because that one word just describes it. So basically, I mean, nowadays the words are in, used interchangeably. Um, I just prefer to use the word celibate, even though the original word um, is referred to like priests or nuns. I just feel like words change over time. Not, let me not say that. The context of the words sometimes change over time. And what I mean by that is, although that was the original purpose for the word, sometimes things change based on the context. So an example of that would be, um, well, there's a few. This past weekend, Resurrection Sunday, right, says Easter Sunday. Everybody knows Easter has bunnies and eggs, has nothing to do with Christ. But because there's a context that connects Easter to Resurrection Sunday, people say Happy Easter, 
personally, I don't, but it's, it's a different context to it. Another example of that would be the curse words. So I don't want to curse in your podcast, but it, right? It, I said it without the D. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, the original word for it was a female, is a female doll, not was, is a female doll. But you'll never hear someone refer to a dog as an itch anywhere unless they're, you know, just about that life and they just like to use that word. But that, that word has taken on a different meaning. It's now a derogatory term. The context has been changed. And so now you can't just walk around saying itch because it's not socially appropriate. And so when I say that the word celibate has changed in context, I just mean that it's now widely understood to be, especially in the Christian community, to be uh, waiting until marriage. Like, when I say I'm celibate, nobody thinks I'm a priest, (laughs) or nobody thinks I'm a nun. They understand exactly what I'm saying to them. And so, for me, that's why I prefer to use the word celibate, Um, but I'm not a big debater. Um, So, if somebody prefers to use the word abstinent, I, for me, if I know your way into marriage, I'm going to say God bless you <laughs> on your on your journey, because um, I don't I care about your attention. I care about your acts, what you're doing, your obedience. I don't really get hung up on whether you're calling it purity, abstinence, celibate, whatever you call it. If you waiting in some marriage, God bless you. <laughs> so that's how I see it. But I hope that answered it. Yeah, and, I would. A long-winded way, but <laughs> yeah, I definitely know what you were saying, and I like how you use the examples of the different things because um, a lot of people might have said, "Okay, well, how, how do you get the first example?" And the fact that you you like Easter and the different types of words and everything, I like that because, um, like you said. It really, it just depends also on how the person is raised and what they've been around and what they've heard other people saying. So, yeah, yeah, their experiences with those words. So they might not have known, oh, this is a synonym for um, celibacy or, well, being celibate. um, And they didn't know that um, celibate was a word for abstinence and things of that sort. The word purity. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, I was done. <laughs> no, but I'm saying people really do draw the line, and, and some people are very literal with those terms, and I understand it. Um, I'm not against it or for it, uh, mm-hmm. but for me personally, like, nobody can convince me to be like, oh, I'm abstinent. Like, if I prefer to say celibate, then that's what I prefer to say. My pastor says it, um, and some of the, the the people that we love say it, but nobody like comes in their comments and says, "Why are you saying celibate and not abstinent?" And some of those people are Megan Good, Aaron Jake. I posted clips and videos of both of them using the word celibate, and mm-hmm. nobody's like, "Why aren't they saying abstinent?" You know, so it's like yeah. it's it's I don't under I don't get it, <laughs> but yeah. it happens. It happens, but that's my piece with it. So what might be um, considered warning signs or characteristics of a person who doesn't consider um, celibacy or abstinence? We were (laughs) talking about it, and I I have it in the question of celibacy, but I I wanted to say abstinence, using it interchangeably, like we said. (laughs) So, like, so how would I know if someone is one over the other? Yeah, so say if you, say if, you were coming in contact with someone and you they were considered like trying to date you and everything like if you how would you know that that person isn't for you or not how like would if, i know that person is celibate or not or yeah so how do you how do you know they they are well uh, are genuine with their celibacy well, that's the thing about celibacy and accident, right? Because some men, um, or some people, not just men, I've met girls or talked to girls who are, um, at, they're just waiting because they got good morals. Like, they don't really 
tie it to their faith. Mm-hmm. So it's not like, oh, I'm waiting because I'm trying to obey God's word. It's more so I, I just don't want to give my body away. <laughs> like I just, mm-hmm. you know, I have a moral standard or in conduct with my body, so I just choose not to give it away. But um, what she was expressing to me was that I, I want to, you know, tie in faith. I want to make it a faith thing. And so to, to your question, when you're talking to somebody, um, you can tell whether they're abstaining um, just because or if it's tied to religion based on their responses um, <clears throat> because they're, they're not the same. Because, like I said, an atheist can be abstaining from sex. That doesn't mean we're going to be equally yoked, right? Just because we're both, you know, not having sex. <laughs> I'm waiting because of my faith. So it's like that has to be a, a mutual understanding. And so you got to ask questions. You got to ask questions and you got to, you know, get to the, the root of their weight and why they're waiting, um, their purpose behind their weight. And, um, you know, their their reactions to it, honestly, when you first talk to someone about celibacy and they're taken aback or they, you know, you can see their facial expressions or their body language or maybe if you just meet a guy and you tell them and then the text slow down and the calls slow, slow down, you know, there's red flags everywhere. And there, you know, there's warning signs everywhere to show you if this person is about his life or they not. You just gotta pay attention to it and not be so. You know, sometimes when you when you really want it to work, you kind of like blazing over a lot of stuff. But if you're really paying attention and seeing, you know, what this person is showing you, then I I think you would be able to know. Like, okay, is this person waiting? Are they not waiting? Are they, you know, just abstaining, or are they doing it for God? You know, what's what? Yeah, when I think about this question, I was more so in my mind thinking about, okay, how would I know if someone is, like a warning sign with me would be um, someone flip-flopping between the answers, like, oh, well, I'm I'm celibate, but, oh, let's, um, let's do other things that might encourage um sexual activity, things of that sort. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So someone portraying themselves as celibate, but they're yeah, really not. Yeah, <laughs> hopping the fence, yeah. Oh, so those warning signs. Okay, so for that, I mean, that's pretty, like like you said, like so that is a perfect example. But just in general, um, also still in conversation, uh, somebody that's, like constantly talking about sex or, mm-hmm. you know, asking you hypotheticals about sex. Like, well, you know, what kind of circumstances would you do this? Like, you know, what if you were in a real serious relationship and it's been a couple of years, would you consider, you know, those type of hypotheticals are like red flags. This is like, I'm telling you, I'm waiting until marriage. It's like, <laughs> there is no before that or anything like that. And there's those people, like you said, you say, They'll say, oh, I'm celibate, but they'll try you. They'll test you. And I think a lot of men do. I think it's a lot of times up to the woman to really hold that standard and really, you know, like call it out. Like, oh, not nah, like we're not about to do this. And so there, the warning signs are very obvious. You know, it's nothing that you have to dig for because it just it stands out. It's kind of like, mm. Like, for me, especially, uh, I can see it a mile away these days because i just, you know, been in my, my walk for a while, you know, this journey for a while. So um, I don't have any, like, exact, you know, because I'm just, I, you wouldn't even be able to get that close to me. Like, you wouldn't even get an opportunity to, to, to fake it with me. Yeah. Just, yeah, I'm just so... Yeah, <laughs> so it's hard for me to, like, really paint a picture of, like, hmm, because it's, like, I can, I can see it from a mile away. Yeah, I definitely understand what you're saying. Like, um, I wouldn't 
like if I was in your position and been on the journey very, very long, I, I know I would be able to see it too. I just wanted to see what things that you might have encountered that someone like me or other listeners who might have said, okay, I'm going to start my journey um, of celibacy and these are some things I might want to look for. It's like you, like you're an OG to us in this celibacy game. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I think, I think, you know, there, there has to be before you even like a lot of conversation has to take place before you even allow someone to like, before you go on that date, you know what I mean? It's like talk, like have conversation, you know, meet in public places, maybe go to a coffee shop or whatever, but talk and really, you know, dig deep, get into this person's, you know, thought process and see what they're thinking. Because I feel like everything you need to know, someone tells you. It's just a matter if you're listening or if you're paying attention. And so that's why I always go back to conversation. Because if you're listening and you're asking these questions and you're hearing the responses, then this person shouldn't even make it to a first date or to a place where you guys are sitting on the couch and watching TV and they have an opportunity to, like, you know, make a move or something like that. Because in my mind, it's like, well, how did we get here? Because <laughs> it's like I would have seen the, the red flag before that even came, you know? So that's why I just feel like conversation when you're first meeting someone is very, very important because you want to see their opinions on it. You want to see where they stand how they were raised, what, what they believe, because, uh, you know, some men can just tell you, like, I don't believe in waiting. Like, I, like they don't see it. And, um, and even if they do say they're waiting, a lot of men will still try you. They will still say, all right, yeah, you're waiting. You know, the, the example, 2016 example, is like the beginning of the night, I said I was a celibate. <laughs> Did that matter to him? Absolutely not. So it's just a matter of, you know, having those conversations before you even get to the date or get to the to to the place of where they even have an opportunity to, to do something from left field. You know what I mean? Yes. Um and that's most definitely a thing. If you elaborate on the conversation portion, now I understand why you begin to um, answer the question the way that you did. And that leads up to the question that I wanted to ask. Um, celibacy is a spiritual and mental journey with God. Um, so what was the toughest part about making the transition? Um, would you say it was, um, with yourself, like getting yourself in a routine that you were going to stick to um, with being obedient, or would it be other people who were trying, you were trying to get to understand you, or what was it? Um, I think the toughest part about making the transition was the isolation period. Uh, when I was, you know, going on this spiritual mission mental journey with God and deciding to be celibate, um, a lot of my friends and people I was hanging around, they didn't understand per se. Not, I don't want to say they didn't understand. It's nothing that I really explained to them for them to understand. But it was more so like, I can't go to these parties. I can't go to these clubs. I can't, you know, the things I would normally hang out with them those environments, I cut them out. So gradually, I just stopped getting invites. <laughs> um, you know, the phone calls wasn't as much. Uh, you know, things just changed. And there was a time where I felt very, very isolated. And I felt alone. I, I did. And it wasn't that I was literally alone. Because at, at this time, I was with my uh, boyfriend. And he was celibate, but I felt like he had a community. I felt like he had he had friends that were celibate as well, and so he had some sort of community, some some accountability. 
for me, even though I had him, I just felt so alone. Like, I didn't have any girls that I can go to and be like, you know, talk about this to or anyone that could understand what I was going through because they weren't about this life. They didn't want to be about this life. They didn't care to be about this life. And so, for me, that was probably the toughest part because I just felt so alone in, in my walk. But looking back, I felt like the isolation period was needed for me to separate myself and, and grow farther. And I can but see that. Was that. Really tough. I was going to say, yeah, I could definitely see that because um, they weren't relatable to you anymore, and that's why – you probably felt isolated, um, and they were like, okay, well, she doing her own thing, and she want to come with us, and we see her switching up. Yeah. So they, basically, they don't necessarily know why. They just, it's like she's turning on the invite. She's not coming around. She's not, you know, she's saying no every time we ask, so we're just going to stop asking. <laughs> so it's kind of <laughs> like, you know. Did you? Eventually. I was gonna say, did you eventually explain it to them, or they know they knew what, all, like everything that ended up was because of your journey? Um, eventually they knew because I started talking about it on my blog. Well, not before I had the blog. I just started talking about it on social media, and um, I started telling people. And it wasn't a secret. It was never a secret. It it just wasn't something I was just going around just like, oh, I'm not coming out because I'm celibate. <laughs> like, it, you know, yeah. it, it wasn't more like one of those type of things. It was just like, you know, um, eventually they just all knew. And when and once they knew, it was respected. So if I uh, did go somewhere, like, for example, one of the girls had got married and um, there was like a what is a cocktail hour, and the bride was like, "Everybody take shots," and she was handing out shot glasses, and she's like, "Not you, Karima, we know." And it was like, you know, but I could see the respect, and I really appreciated that because it was like everybody knew where I stood, and so it wasn't, it was nothing. It was kind of like it was a great feeling for me. So yeah, and that's one of the things that. Once you get into a lifestyle that people can understand, you don't have those people around you. You know who is for you and who is not for you. Like you said, she's like, oh, no, not you. You're not getting one. Like other people will be like, oh, just take this. You'll have just this one. Yeah, like the next one. I'm getting married. Like it wasn't no prayer pressure. It wasn't like try to make me cave or anything like that. It was all love. So that's really good. Some misconceptions that young adults um, and even millennials have about the weight. Um, <laughs> some people think like um, the weight is kind of like a guarantee for a husband or a guarantee for marriage, and it's not. <laughs> it's not. That's why I I try to emphasize to wait out of obedience, not to get something in return because you may not get that marriage or you may not have that husband um, that you yearn for um, because we're we're just not guaranteed. There's no promise of that. So um, that's a misconception. Another misconception is um, that waiting is boring. Like people think you got to live this boring lifestyle. So a lot of times I'm trying to show my lifestyle um, in different ways that I can so that people can see that it's not boring. Like, um, it's such not a boring lifestyle. It's just your perspective and who are you around. And there's so much other things. But when you're used to a life of just partying or just, like, that's your that's considered your fun. Like, you know, when you say you're about to go have fun this weekend, it's going out to a club or a lounge, you're getting turned and getting drunk. So if you are used to doing that every weekend and you decide to be celibate and now you're looking like, well, what is fun? (laughs) Because that that was my fun. So it's like, what is fun now? And you got to discover a whole new world of fun. And so I try to show uh, a lifestyle that that shows 
Like, you don't have to be boring. You don't have to be this cornball that's just, like, waiting. <laughs> so I think that's a, a misconception about the wait. And um, what's another one? I mean, there's there's quite a few, like, myths uh, about it or, you know, misconceptions. Um, trying to think of some. Actually, let me see. I got my laptop right here in front of me, and I actually um, had notes about this already. Let me just. Um, <clears throat> oh, another misconception is in order to be celibate, you have to be perfect. I hear a lot of women um, say that they don't want to be, they don't make the commitment to wait because they feel like they're going to fail or they're going to fail God or something like that. And it's this idea that in order to be on this journey, you have to be perfect. But we're not even perfect in our walks with Christ. You know, we sin and fall short every single day uh, for the most part, whether we think it, whether we do it, say it, however, uh, there's always something or some area that we sometimes fall short. So to 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 think there's grace there, but there's not grace in your celibacy, to me is a misconception. Have you ever sought out um, any mentors to help you along with your journey, or has it just been you alone? I didn't. I didn't um, seek out any mentors. Uh, coming into my journey, I honestly didn't know anything. Uh, outside of God wanting me to wait. Like, you know what I mean? So I wasn't, like, I didn't know this whole community of, like, waiting women was out there. That wasn't on my timeline. That wasn't on my social media. I wasn't following those type of pages. I didn't know those pages existed. (laughs) So for me, it was like, this is, like, brand thinking new territory. And, um, I didn't even think to be like, who can I reach out to or who? I know the people around me um, wasn't doing it, so it wasn't no mentors in that way. Um, I did gravitate towards like-minded people um, who were waiting, but as far as a mentor, I, I didn't seek one out. So that that goes back to that isolation that I felt earlier on. But um, yeah, so I did not. But would I recommend it? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. If I know what I, if I know, what, what's the, how does thing go? If I know what I knew now, or, you get what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> if I, 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 I would, know I, would I would recommend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would recommend a mentor for sure. Yeah, because that, like, that's one of the reasons, like, I I'm not even going to lie. Like, I've been, like, bouncing back and forth like with my journey. Like, okay, all of these things are happening. Yeah, I need to consider celibacy. And then something else will happen, and then I will fall short of it. And don't get me wrong, every single time something like that happens, and, well, every single day that I wake up, I, for, I ask God to forgive me for the sins that I've committed and the sins that I will commit in the future. So, I'm kind of, like, saving myself from there, but also I'm just like, okay, like, I feel like I wouldn't keep making these same mistakes if I had a mentor. So I definitely i am glad that you said that if you would have sought out a mentor earlier, then it would have helped you along your journey. So yeah. I know that people can consider that when they're taking their first step to have someone who – has either been on the part of the journey prior um, and is now, like, married and everything, or if they have, um, they're still with um, within their journey but have been in it really longer and have a lot of experience. Yeah, it's, it's good because you can, if you're by yourself, you have nothing to compare it to. You're like, okay, mm-hmm. am I like am I the only one that like <laughs> or does everybody else have this problem? You know, so it's like having that mentor is someone that that's walked that walk. So you can be like, Okay, like, oh that's a normal girl. You know, don't even worry about it, get back up. You know, somebody to com- 
you know, encourage you, to push you, to keep you on track. And so I think it's I think it's very important to have one, and especially like you know in your local church or wherever you go, just to even have a, a sister or a sister in Christ, a friend, someone that you can hold accountable, like they can hold you accountable um, to your to what you're doing. So you can go to somebody and say like like bro, like I'm I'm struggling right now. Let's take a break and hear a message from our sponsors. Hey you, why haven't you made your own podcast yet? Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. It's easy as one, two, three. I'm telling you, you can make money from your couch, on vacation, sleeping, awake, upside down, on the toilet. I mean, it's easy, easy as one, two, three. Go ahead and download the Anchor app and get started today. Hey, peacemakers. Now, this is a little break in between the show, but let's sit down. Let's talk about something. So everybody has been coming to me ever since I started my podcast asking, how do you do it? What's your setup? What's going on? How did you start your podcast? How much money did it cost? Well, here's the answer. I'm going ju- to just let you in on this secret. It's called Anchor. Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing your podcast. Best of all, it's 100% free and ridiculously easy to use. Like, even a turtle could use it, and they're pretty slow. <laughs> but, yeah. And now Anchor can match you with great sponsors who want to advertise on your podcast. That means you can get paid for your podcast right away. Cha-ching! Now, who doesn't love money, especially free money, for you talking and somebody wants to just advertise their business in between you talking? I mean, it's so easy. Even a baby could do it. But, yeah. In fact... That's what I'm meaning right now. Like this ad is basically a sponsor ad and I'm getting paid just to talk to you about Anchor. So if you want to get started, if you want to make money for your couch, you know, like that. Um, What is that freaking the is it not the Vry education connection commercial? And they're like, get up off your couch. You're doing nothing. Blah, blah, blah. But guess what? Now you can sit on your couch. You can just go to anchor.fm slash start in. You can join me and hundreds of other people who don't know what they're doing. All you just got to do is click the buttons. Bam. Publish it. Talk. Yeah. That's it. You can add your own background music. Do whatever you want. And guess what? You're getting paid. You don't need a degree. You don't need a certificate. You don't need a license. I'm telling you, even a baby could do it. So set your child up for success and and let them make a podcast. I'm just saying. <laughs> so you guys, that is my spill. So come join me in the community of diverse podcasters and talk about whatever the heck you want to talk about. All right. Hashtag keep smiling. Let's get back to the show. And they like, they might say to you, "Hey, I'm struggling too." But it's like it's different when it's like you have someone to bounce that off of, as opposed to when it's just you. It's like it gets lonely. You're like, I and it also, I was gonna say, it also makes me think about those memes, like you know when you're you're sick and then you google something and it's like it says you're dying and then like yeah. you instead of you going to a doctor somebody who's an expert and trying to figure out what's wrong with you you're just googling stuff you trying to figure it out on your own you're taking the wrong right. medicine you over here telling people you, you got you 12 got days to live <laughs> exactly you got a tumor I, I you got a migraine <laughs> 
definitely done that before. Yeah, we all have. So what are some books, scriptures, or sermons that you listen to um, to help you stay motivated on your path? Um, Bible, first and foremost, <laughs> um, I think it's important to stay in your word. There's power in the word. And, you know, a lot of really young people, they might think it's cliche or like, ah. But when you really have that solid relationship uh, with God, you realize how important it is to be in your word. And so just being adamant about that. Also, devotionals. There's a lot of devotionals on the Bible app um, pertaining to purity, pertaining to, um, you know, being pure and waiting and resisting sexual sin and all those type of things. So reading those devotionals are awesome. I would think a lot of, you know, if anybody needs that type of material, find those devotionals. Uh, Books, The Weight, that was the first book I read, Um, you know, coming into the journey. So I definitely will recommend that as a good starting foot. A lot of my books, I I have a lot of books. (laughs) A lot of my books are... um, they're not necessarily about sex, but I, I kind of tend to focus on um, women in the Bible or um, just learning from them, like the type of woman that they were and, you know, how they carried themselves, how they prayed, how they were anointed, whatever the, their story is. And so um, it does always go back to the word. Um, a good sermon, I, I listen to a lot of sermons, but um, – I would say the Relationship Goals series is a good series for um, people to watch by Pastor Michael Todd. And um, scriptures, my favorite scriptures, uh, well, my favorite scripture is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which is trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding and in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. So that's my favorite. That's my go-to Whenever I'm feeling any type of way, that scripture always gets me back in line. But a good scripture for the weight would be um, Isaiah 40, 31. And that says, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And that's always encouraging to me because it's like, you know, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. I'll I'll renew my strength by waiting on him. And so um, those are some of the ones that are just off the top of my head uh, that come to mind. But a lot of it for me is the word, the Bible, and uh, devotional. Going back to your journey um, when you first started, um at what point in time did you start publicizing your journey of celibacy and what were the reactions from people when you posted it on social media? Um, I started posting about celibacy probably two or three months after I declared my vow to celibacy. So very fresh. I didn't even think about it. It wasn't even a thought in my mind. It was kind of just like, okay, I'm sharing this. <laughs> and I shared it. It wasn't, I know nowadays, when I, well, when I talk to other people, I see that it's more of a process. And sometimes they're scared to, um, you know, uh, let the world know or, you know, there's some type of fear there. But for me, I didn't have that. So, um, so my response from people, honestly, I didn't get any, like, crazy feedback. I didn't get anybody saying, like, what, you crazy, not uh like, you know, none of that. It was it was all, like, you know, the likes were few. <laughs> it was probably, like, uh, like, 10 likes or something on my post. But for me, it was, like, I celebrate every milestone. So if I got 10 likes, I was, like, ooh, 10 likes. Like, <laughs> Um, when I got 30, it was like, oh, 30 likes, like, you know, it was yeah. like, I celebrated everything, so I didn't see it as, like, a negative, it was just kind of like, you know, people who that, people get used to it, and, um, so I think eventually, like, the people that may have been, especially people that know me from college, I was kind of wild in college, 
Um, mm-hmm. So, and a lot of my college friends follow me on social media. So I think, although it wasn't said to me, a lot of them were probably skeptical about like this party girl that was always at like she party was a turn up queen. Exactly, <laughs> queen. Like I felt like if I wasn't at the party, then the party wasn't popping. Like that's oh my just, god. How I am. <laughs> like in my head, it was just like I was just the queen of of the church life, and so I wondered what they thought. Like, man, they probably think I'm. I was like, nah, but I'm serious, and that was a way to hold myself accountable by putting it out in the public. Like, all right, like y'all want to see? Like, yeah, like <laughs> and people are as time went, huh? No, I'm saying like people are watching you. Like, you know how when you take on a role to be a mentor and you make that commitment, you know that you have to do what you need to do because other people are watching you and you don't want to mess up because you don't want to disappoint them and yourself. Right. And so I knew they were watching. And so uh, it was funny because later, like the more, like maybe years later, uh, after being public about my blog, there's been people who have bought shirts that I've known from college or um, who have just asked me questions about it or mentioned that they're celibate now. And I know for a fact that I um, encourage or, you know, a lot of people to take this walk or to at least think about it more deeply than they than they did before. And so it's interesting when they – when they, you know, come to me and mention it. I'm like, what? Like, you know, because I know them from college too, so I know what they was about. So it's it's interesting. Okay. And with your blog, um, what is exactly your blog Karima Knows about? So Karima Knows is the reason, so the name Karima Knows is basically, it came about because, it was like Karima knows what it's like to be single. Karima knows what it's like to be in a relationship. Karima knows what it's like to be celibate. Karima knows what it's like to be in a situation. Like, you ain't even get to the relationship part yet. <laughs> and so um, that's where the name came from. It was from a relatable stance of, like, I can relate to you. Like, I know what it's like to be in these different stages. And so the blog is a platform to encourage singles, to encourage those who are waiting, to encourage, you know, people who are in a relationship to have a godly perspective in their relationship, like not just to be, you know, dating a date, but dating with intentions, you know, to be married or, you know, practicing celibacy in their relationship. So everything has a, um, uh, it ties back to my faith. So, it's just a, a, a platform that offers this encouragement, this insight, bits and pieces of my testimony. There's truth there. There's um, there's just a lot of encouraging pieces for those women. You know, I feel like I am those women. Like, I've been in all those places. I know what it feels like to be in all those different stages. So when I write those pieces, a piece of them are, you know, me. And so that's what the blog is about. It's about uplifting and encouraging the people that's in those those categories that I mentioned. Yeah, and, and ultimately to... encouraging them to, you know, be solid. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, that's the like, you know, to, to take home, like to encourage them to be celibate, and by becoming celibate, growing closer to Christ. And so. Ultimately, that's the the goal of the blog. Like, I wanted to attract people who weren't in the faith. Like, when I first started my blog, that was my my mindset. Like, people in faith, you're already in, you, you know, you're already here. But how can I attract those who aren't inside the faith, who aren't, who haven't came to Christ? And so through my pieces, I wanted to be relatable. So maybe a girl who is atheist or a girl who, is, um, who isn't saved or something like that, she may just read a blog because it's a good piece 
But if she keeps reading those blogs and she keeps understanding my faith, then maybe that will draw her closer to Christ. And so that was my mindset um, when I started the blog. And it's still my mindset. I still would like to see that um, happen, that change in people's lives. So I hope that, and I, that answers it. <laughs> yeah, and I think that a lot of people um, – continue to follow you um, like as they're making their mind up about their journey or um, even if they're in their walk, um, I believe that they continue to follow you and use you as a guideline because you're so transparent and the fact that on your blog you're talking about all of these different scenarios and things that you have encountered. So, and this is not often that you see a black millennial out here just telling, hey, everybody, I'm celibate, because Mm -hmm. everything nowadays is just so sexualized, this and this and this, and a lot of people try to, a lot of females who are in um, the music industry or just influencers, they sexualize Everything, everything and they try to put that on a platform like yes yeah, you gotta use this this and this and you gotta do this this and this and you know what's one bad thing that um i hear a lot of old people say this like older people say this um and especially when you have older women they're like oh yeah if you if you don't have a job or if you um basically um what is the saying if you don't have a job or you need a, a way to get money, use what's between your legs. That's what God gave it to you for. Like trying to put those oh. two things together, and I'm like, oh my! I think God. I have heard that before. <laughs> and it's like, why put those two things together? That's not what that was for. Right, right, whatsoever. It's the complete opposite, actually. But yes, and so like I'm pretty sure it's for. Uh, you know, marriage, but okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, it's a lot of it's a lot of sex and everything, like sex sells. That saying is so true. Like things that couldn't be sexualized are now sexualized. Like I could see a commercial for deodorant and it's sexualized. It's like like how did they even deodorant? make emoji sexualized? Like nobody thought about the eggplant emoji being representing that. Like Right. Why? Why? Like, and now, like, little kids who might use that or, like, teenagers, they're just like, oh, he, he. you can't even send an eggplant emoji without it being meaning something else. Right. So, oh, my God. I just, I wish that things were more, I want, I want to say, decentralized and sensitized so that we want to have to revert and seem like, oh, she's the um, the white sheep or not the white sheep, the right, right. unicorn of everything when you come out and you talk about this because what you are talking about is normal. Right. It's very it's like, normal. Um, and it should be normal inside of the communities that we live in, we talk, people we talk to and everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I, I'm the taboo. <laughs> Which is like what? Like me? Like I'm the taboo when when really I should be the norm. Exactly. So speaking about um you being the unicorn and everything, um, <laughs> when you came out with your shirt, how how did people react to that? Your I celibate t shirt. How did that idea come about and what was your reaction? Um, so that came about 2016 or was it 2017? It was 2016, I believe. Either way, <laughs> I had a, did a retreat with, um, a few of the girls that I mentor. And in that retreat, we were doing, uh, a video shoot slash photo shoot. And I got each one of them a shirt made, and each shirt had a quote on it regarding the weight. It either said, like, worth the weight or clothes and legs clothes until marriage or something like that. The shirt that I had on said, I celibate. 
and it was a play off of iPhone, of course. And um, I wear that shirt for that reason. And when I wear it, um, people liked it. And I started getting messages and comments about it, and they wanted it. And I was like, I had no intention of going to sell on that shirt. <laughs> um, it was only supposed to be for that particular day for that shoot. And, of course, I was going to wear it again, but I never had intentions on selling it. But when people were asking for it, I was like, all right, cool. Like, I'm going to sell it then. (laughs) And so I did. And um, since then, a lot of people have bought this shirt, and they wear the shirt. And a lot of people actually use the shirt now as a a way to come out publicly and say, um, declare to the world, like, this is what I'm doing. Because a lot of times people don't know that these women are celibate. And so when they wear the shirt, it's kind of like the first time they're putting everybody on notice. Like, this is the walk I'm walking. So it's kind of cool. Um, so that's where it came from, though. Okay. And one thing that I meant to ask you earlier is, is there ever, um, is it ever, uh, is it ever too late for someone to consider celibacy? Like, do you feel like there is a timeline where you got to be between the ages of 16 and such and such? Or, like, can a 45 year old? Absolutely not. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think you can wait at any age. At any age. I don't think it's ever too late because that's, that's basically saying, like, it's too late to do God's word. And it's like, how is that? (laughs) You know? So it's like, it's never too late. I don't care if she was 60. Like, you can wait. You you might, you know, I don't want to say that. I was in my head, I was thinking you might die waiting. But it's like, you're you're doing what God's word says. And that's what's most important. So whatever age that may be, it's never too late to do it. It's never too late to make that commitment. And so... I would say it's never too late. You can wait at any age. Okay. And with you having a good grasp on the weight and having a platform, have you ever considered mentoring people on the weight? Well, I do. Um, I have a group of girls. um, Well, not girls, young women, I should say. They're in their early 20s. It's about 12 of them. And so when I mentioned the celibacy retreats and things I do, it's for this group of 12. So actually this year we'll be going on our third celibacy retreat. And um, half the girls are in Philly. The other half is in Pittsburgh. And um, we have conference calls every other week. We study the word of God together um, on these calls. We also have girl talk where we talk about practical matters. We talk about um, just anything. You know, we get real transparent and say like what's going on like what's happening and they're able to talk to me even if you know it's not one of our calls they can just call me up and talk to me and tell me what's going on so um and and in between times we like to schedule certain things like we had a potluck um I think I uploaded pictures on that in my social media and on my game night so um I do mentor and I love it. I, I love it. Um, 12 is a good number for me. I don't really open it up to my social media because I'm only one person. Uh, so, um, you know, to really give that undivided attention, uh, the way that the girls got in the group was kind of like word of mouth. So they were in it and they kind of told their friend and they told their friend. And, and so that's how we got our little, our little group together. And, um, yeah, so uh, I do – do that, but it's not on like a large scale, at least not right now. And like, if you post it, hey, I'm mentoring now, DMs would be flooding and everything. Yes. <laughs> and and I'm like, Lord, what did I get myself into? Yes. <laughs> then you have to start doing seminars and traveling around the yeah. world and all types of stuff. Even though if that's what you're calling is, it will come. But right now, I feel like you will be it would be too, like, a too vast of a group for you to get your hands Yeah, to do by myself. Intimate, because this is an intimate topic, and you don't want to be like, oh, I'm just getting generalized. 
information yeah. on this. This is some this is a person's life. Yeah, I think it's very intimate. And so for me, um, like say if five hundred people wanted to be mentor, I wouldn't be able to give them the individual attention that they need to really be effective in their walk. Mm-hmm. Um And so with me having a small group of 12, I'm able to talk to them. They're able to call me. Like, I remember when one of my girls declared her vow to celibacy, she texted me at like 10, 11 o'clock at night. She's like, I just wanted to let you know, because I let them move at their own pace. You know, I let them make that decision on their own. Um, And so just watching them grow is like the greatest fulfillment. You know, a, a few of them, at least like five or six of them have, been um, mentored by me for the past couple of years in counting and so just seeing who they were on day one and who they are now they're like flourishing man they're flourishing they're growing into the woman of God that they are you know called to be and they're you know getting connected to kingdom like just doing kingdom work and ministry and all those good things so it's very very awesome to to be in a position to mentor them and and see them grow and see them it's beautiful i i can't even put in the words uh the the feeling that the fulfillment that i get so that's how i know it's like my my passion because how it makes me feel to to see them grow is is words can't describe i can imagine So how do celibacy um, in your walk with God bring you a peace of mind? Oh, yeah. So much peace. (laughs) So much peace. It's so, oh, my gosh. Where do I start? Especially when I can look back and compare it to my life before I made the decision. Man, it's like God's word, his word is just, it brings peace. You know, it it really is, it it really transcends and surpasses all your understanding. Like, those words to me aren't just words in a book. It's really my reality. Like, he keeps me in a perfect peace day in and day out. Even when I have bad days, like, I'm just always basking about his words because I've grown spiritually during my walk. And that's, the funny thing is I didn't even, it's like, it's a two for one deal. Like a lot of people think about the weight, which myself in, included did that. It's kind of like, okay, um, I'm going to stop having sex. You make that decision, but you don't really make that decision to kind of surrender your whole life. It's kind of like you're surrendering that one area, but by surrendering that one area, everything else changes. Because now you're getting in your word because you need the, the strength. You need to be able to get through. And so now you're relying on the word. You're going to your word and you're getting more plugged in. And so all this does is just builds you up. And when you're able to be built up on God's word, those scriptures, you just hear them in your head. Like when situations come up or something's bothering me, like I can just play God's word in my mind. For every situation and so it just brings me peace like I sleep good at night I wake up good in the morning <laughs> um I go about my day in peace my outlook on life is just peaceful um there's not too many things I get bothered by or frustrated by I understand and I recognize that everything I see is temporary and I'm not living for what is in front of me it's just a different outlook And when you can have that different outlook that just puts God first and it's not really about materials or houses and cars and having the most money and all that stuff, when it's really just on God, that's where the peace is, man. And you can't put a price on peace. So this this walk really does just – it's a gateway. You ever heard of gateway drugs? Like, Oh, yeah. Not not to say, like, you know, but this is a gateway. To your spiritual life, it, it just gets you into this life of abundance, of peace and, and joy, and you, you just get a, a new a new walk. Let's have some fun. Yay! Favorite TV show. 
Um, I don't really have a favorite TV show, but the the two that I watch the most right now are Married at First Sight. I kind of like that show. <laughs> um, that and I like. To me. It's, it's funny to me. Um, I know some Christians are probably like, oh, they're making a mockery of you know. So I, I get both sides, but I do enjoy watching it. So can't lie. Um, and I like Chop, which is uh, on a Food Network. Okay. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? One superpower, I would read people's minds. I would just know what they're thinking. <laughs> okay. Can't well, hide you that one. <laughs> Why would you choose that superpower? Oh, why did I choose it? Because um, a lot of times you have to discern. You have to, you know, be able to analyze situations to see what's what. Um, and that takes growth. That takes a lot of, you know, um, you know, it, it takes a lot. And if you can read someone's mind, you can just, you can just be looking at them and you're like, mm, nope. <laughs> like that ain't it like I'm out like you know so you could just see people intentions and see what their thought process are or you know just get in their mind because a lot of times you meet people not just relation like in relationship settings just in general um you meet people and you wonder what their intentions are mm-hmm. you know do they have good intentions or if they have bad intentions or or are they just selfish in what their motives are? Like maybe their motives is all about self and not about, you know, serving or kingdom. And so, you know, if you could just get a glimpse of their mind real quick, it, you know, you'd be good. You'd be like, all right, <laughs> let me use my superpower. Exactly. Activate. <laughs> <laughs> right. Tap in. I'm like, oh, no, I, I don't think this is going to work. <laughs> Exactly. So if you could meet two people from the Bible, who would they be? Two people from the Bible. Um, Jesus, of course. Um, definitely would meet him. And I would meet Solomon. And those are why would you choose Solomon? I would choose Solomon because he was the wisest man to walk this earth outside of Jesus, of course. Um, <laughs> so to to just sit down and talk with him and to to hear that wisdom, man, to me that would just be amazing, amazing. Like I I think it's like super, like super, super, super dope. And so just to be able to meet him and to hear that wisdom, to, to hear all that he knows and to hear him speak and talk, and, and it would just be incredible. It would be my two. Okay. So this is a, a question that's not on those topics. So would you rather live somewhere that is hot or cold and why? Hot. <laughs> And the reason why is because I hate being cold. I can't stand being cold. Like, New York is always cold, and I can't stand it. And um, so I would just go somewhere hot just because I, I prefer the more, you know, the hot or the warmer temperatures. I was just about to say, how do you live somewhere that is very cold, but you like a warm place? <laughs> But I can yeah. understand what you're saying. I do not like the cold. I live in Maryland. I'm from Georgia, but I'm here in Maryland because it wasn't my choice. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, I always got the heat on, and my mom was like that. Like we don't care about the bill. We were blessed at heat. Whatever that bill gonna be, we gonna pay. It. But <laughs> I'm blasting it. <laughs> I am blasting it because I hate being cold. Yeah, that's like me too. I like being warm. I sleep under two blankets. I don't care if it is summertime outside. I still sleep under two blankets. Oh, wow. (laughs) (laughs) So, when buying ice cream, what ice cream brand and flavor do you get and why? Um, Well, I only, like, I I like uh, 
I don't know if it's considered ice cream, but Salenti. Oh, yes, um, gelato. Yes, that's my favorite one. That's what I eat. <laughs> Southern butter pecan is my favorite uh, flavor. And um, I just love it. And, you know, it's just so good. It just melts in your mouth. And I'm not, you know, ice cream, I stay away because, you know, it's, it's not really my friend. <laughs> and so I don't really have those issues with the let's see. So it's like. Yes, the gelato you know, is just so good. Like, it's so, it doesn't get freezer burned. And if it does, it takes a long time. I've had, yeah. I've, I've let my, like, I bought two pints at one time eat one, and then I'll um, go to eat the other one, and it's been like a couple of weeks or maybe like maybe a month or two at the latest that I've left one in there. It still doesn't go bad. I'm just like, hey, this is so yeah. good. I always get the um, caramel cookie crunch. That kind is, oh, my God. Like, I, <laughs> that one. I can't remember if I had that one or not. Yeah, that I got one. Right. You gotta try, and you you know they have layers kind now. They have what kind? Layers. They have salinity layers, so they have layers of ice cream, um, and the things that are made up of it. So they might have um the ice cream on top, and then like they might have a layer of the caramel, and then a layer of the chocolate, like chocolate, oh. pieces, and then a layer of ice cream, and then caramel. Oh, I didn't see that yet. Yes, it's been all over, like, Instagram, on the ads. Like, if you're scrolling, you might see it sometimes. Um, and then I know I've, saw, I've seen it on Snapchat, and I've even seen a commercial for it on TV. Um, yeah, it's check. pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> it looks pretty good, and I'm, hopefully I can find that grocery store in my house. So, do you choose um, tennis shoes or heels, and why? Um, honestly, neither. <laughs> I only wear my tennis shoes to the gym, and I wear heels when I go out. But for the most part, I actually am a boot person. So I like I got thigh high boots, I got knee high boots, I got patent leather boots, I got toe boots, I got ankle boots, like. I am, like, boot queen, apparently, and I didn't realize that until you asked me <laughs> that question. <laughs> I was like, what do I wear most of the time? And I was looking, and I'm like, um, boots. <laughs> I got a lot of boots. And I, so I guess that's, like, my thing. I do, like, a good boot, all different kinds of boots. Wow. So, I only have, like, that's funny. I'm the opposite. I have more. And... I really, I have, like, maybe, well, if you want to count Uggs, then uh, about maybe four or five pairs of boots. I love me a good boot. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I do. I mean, I mean, in the summer, it's, like, flats and sandals and all that. But mm-hmm. in the fall and winter, boot queen. But if I know if I wanted to get you a birthday gift, just give us some boots. <laughs> mm-hmm. A good boot. Let everyone, everybody know where they can find you at. Everybody can find me at Karima Knowles on Instagram. So that's at Karima, K-A-R-E-E-M-A, um, K-N-O-W-S. I can also be um, found on KarimaKnowles.com, same spelling, no spaces, and um on both of those platforms, there's a way to contact me um, to either email me, uh, which my email is creaminals at gmail.com, or through my website, there's a way that you can just contact me and leave a message. So it's all there on those two platforms. This is Karima Knows, and you're listening to Peace of Mind with the Soul Coach. Hey, you guys, I just want to let you know, thank you for listening to my episode and you can keep up with us on Instagram at your underscore peace of mind, me on my personal page at the soul coach coach with a K and we're on Twitter at 
Keep Smiling POM. We're on YouTube at Peace of Mind with TSK. You can email me at your peace of mind 2016 at gmail.com. Um, let me see what else, what else, what else we got. You can find this episode located on Apple Music, Google Play, Spotify everywhere youtube on our channel because we do drop it on there and yeah be sure to rate review give this episode a hand clap give it a thumbs up five stars everything let us know what you want to hear what episode um what features you want to hear on episodes and let's keep it going so peacemakers thank you for keeping this going and hashtag keep smiling